long ago when I read it for the first time, I ended up changing my mind on two subjects in large part due to this chapter and its contents. Um, one was about whether or not there's anything good to say about psychology. Being a, a yeah, I know, Mark. Being, being a physics guy, I, I came to it with the prejudice against anything that psychology could ever say, that that's not a real science. So I was pretty down on psychology. And since then, I have a few more nice things to say about it than I did, like one or two. And then the other thing that I've changed my mind about um, prior to this chapter, I was so devoutly not a Calvinist that it was hard for me to believe that there's anything wrong with a human because of their sin. Like I wanted every human to be born a completely neutral, blank slate, able to do everything right if they wanted to. And it really bugged me that C.S. Lewis, and then, as it turns out, the Bible said otherwise. So I'm still not a Calvinist, but it did change my mind about the fact, a different way of thinking about the fact that we are influenced by our sin and the sins that came before us in the world that we live in, that it's, it's made a mess we have to reckon with. So I don't know if any of those two mean much to you, but that, it's been an important chapter for me. Um, why talk about psychology in a morality class? Uh, this isn't actually in C.S. Lewis, but I thought it was some, worth pointing out. Why would we talk about psychology? And it's important because psychology and morality ask two very different questions. Both of them important, but very different and not to be confused. Okay. So this over here on the right is Jonah from the end of Jonah. How does, how does chapter 4 of Jonah go? Uh, the city of Nineveh repents, and how does Jonah feel about it? Uh, he pouts, he's mad, wants him to burn. Okay. A psychology question is, why is Jonah angry? Okay. What set of values and concerns led him to being angry? What prejudices and behaviors led him to be angry about Nineveh being spared. The morality question is actually the one in the text. God asked Jonah, do you do well to be angry? In other words, do you think it's a good idea for you to be mad about this? One is why, what, what, what's cause and effect? The other is, is it good or bad? And those are two different questions. Psychology wants to analyze cause and effect. Morality wants to know, okay, but is it good or bad? And those are very different questions. So I picked, I looked for a protester picture on the internet, and I, I won't even tell you what year this is from, so you won't have any idea what the young lady is protesting. But I thought it was an interesting sign. I'm too young to be this angry, okay? Over the last decade or 10, we've had a few protests, right? Why is she angry? Something to do with Brahms, no doubt, yeah. I'm too young to be this angry. A psychologist could sit her down in a room and say, why are you angry? And can connect the dots from her value system to circumstances, to behaviors, to train of thought, and say, ah, here's why you're angry, and here's how to reconcile yourself to this situation, either to change your behavior or to accept your behavior so that you can be at peace with whatever it is you're angry about, okay? That's a psychology question. Not a bad question. But morality question says, is this a good or bad thing in the first place? Is this a good or bad thing to be mad about? The psychologist's job, when you go to see a therapist, their job, which again is not a bad thing, I'll say it one more time, is to help you feel resolved and at peace with whatever set of circumstances or choices you find yourself in. It is not to tell you whether those are good or bad. On the other hand, if you come for a visit in my office, I may or may not talk to me about psychology, but I might tell you whether what you're doing is good or bad, because it's a different set of questions. Both of them have a place. So. It's important then, this is a big thing that Lewis points out, 
It's important to maintain the distinction between the techniques and worldview of psychologists. That some of the tools psychologists use to do their job can be useful even when I may or may not share their worldview. So Lewis writes this, it's 1941, 1942. Who would have been the, the name in psychology at that point in time? Freud, yeah, and he comes up in the chapter, right? So Lewis is concerned that Freudian psychoanalysis is going to push morality right out of the picture. Okay. Now, ironically, it's now been 80 years since Lewis wrote this. We still talk about Freud, uh, not as much and not in the same reverence and all. Um, uh, Jung uh, comes up a fair bit and a few other big names since that time that are worth mentioning. But again, there are worldviews associated with those guys. Do they believe in God? Do they believe that you have any spiritual component? Do they think you're just matter in motion? What, what do they think about a human? Like Those are all worldview questions. Their techniques, however, still might be useful. I, I would probably, I'll, I'll give Jung as an example because I know more about him than I do about Freud. Uh, Jung, uh, we use a lot of his ideas, even in theology and Old Testament studies in seminary, we don't buy his worldview necessarily, but we find him very useful because of the way he looked at things. And so there's a difference between tools and worldview. And that's, that's another point that Lewis is going to make. So here he is on Freud. He says, when Freud is talking about how to cure neurotics, he is speaking as a specialist on his own subject. When he goes on to talk general philosophy, he is speaking as an amateur. Okay. He wants to point out that the psychologist can be very good at their specialty. Just be careful that you know what their specialty is. I feel the same way about scientists. Um, Richard Dawkins is an example that I make fun of on a regular basis. Who's, he's an evolutionary biologist, zoologist, and as far as I can tell, in his field of study, pretty clever guy. But he likes to write about religion, philosophy, morality. He's not an expert in those fields, and it shows. But because he has the expertise in some other area, he's kind of credited with, well, he's a smart guy. He must know what he's talking about. Okay. So especially in the modern world, expertise is so narrowly defined. You know, you don't, you don't get a doctorate in all knowledge. You get a doctorate in this tiny little slice of knowledge that you studied, and everybody ends up with a specialty, including psychologists, even a subspecialty and a sub-subspecialty. And so, again, I think psychologists can be very helpful in dealing with certain human problems, but their specialty is not morality or even spirituality. That's a different area. Um, so Lewis says, okay, so now what do I as a Christian think about moral choices and how do they work? He says there are two parts of all moral choices. Um, now, I, for the first time in this class, I will make fun of Lewis a little bit in this chapter because he cheats. Um, he says there's two parts of moral choices, choosing and then the raw material that influences the choice. As a general rule, you're not allowed to use the word in the definition of the word. So what is choosing? Well, there's two parts. There's choosing and the other thing. Yes, what, what's choosing? Well, there's choosing and then the other thing. And, and down and down and down we go. Um, and he admits, he calls it mysterious in the text. He says, it's, yeah, I, I'm a believer in some kind of free will, but don't ask me to define it. It's a little complicated, you know. Is there a pair of dice rolling around in my head and that's how I make decisions? Uh, four. You know, is that, is that how it works? Is there a guy flipping a coin up there? Or is it more complicated than that? I'm not exactly sure how free will works, and apparently Lewis says me either. He says, but there's this kind of weird, human, choosy part of it. And then there's this other stuff you have no control over, which influences the choosy part. Uh, psychology, he says, is really good at analyzing the raw material. 
What kind of family did you come from? What experiences have you had? What's going on in your brain chemistry? What behaviors are influencing your behavior? Okay. On the other hand, they're not necessarily good at this part of it, of just saying, okay, what choice did you make next? And that's very different. Um, another way to think of the two parts of morality is to say there's the image of God part and then there is the consequence of sin part. Ideally, I'm made in the image of God, so I should just make all good decisions all the time, right? And he does. It turns out it doesn't work that way because I'm not God in, in quite a few ways. And so what we, we, we learn to distinguish when we're talking about our behaviors and morality is there's a part of us that we want to encourage and part of us that we want to discourage. All of us have both. The bad psychological material is not a sin, but a disease. It does not need to be repented of, but to be cured. And that statement, I think, really warrants some discussion that I want to have tonight of what does Lewis mean by that, and more importantly, what does the Bible teach about the, the raw material that you've got right now. When you make a decision, what do you bring to it? How flawed are you? when you go to make a decision? Can you even trust yourself to make a good decision? This comes up a lot when we talk about morality because someone will say, Ben, this thing that you say is wrong, it just feels natural to me. It just seems like the right way to do it. And then I say, well, the Bible says this, but yeah, it doesn't feel. See, it feels like that would be counter to what my inclination says to do. And what Lewis would say is, yeah, it's because you all have a disease. And it's not that you've done something wrong, it's that you are something wrong. And you need a cure before you can start making good decisions again. A comparison is kind of like bad posture. Okay. Um, if you have bad posture, your steps don't always land where they're supposed to, right? Is it because you're an immoral person who can't walk straight? Well, not exactly. It's because your back's crooked. <laughs> that, that one thing makes it impossible to do the other thing correctly. You can use another example. Celine had shoulder surgery. She can't reach high things on the shelf real well. Does she not want it bad enough? Well, it's not a lack of willpower. Promise. Not a lack of willpower. But there's something wrong with the mechanism, right? It just isn't ready to do that yet. And that's what happens to us as a consequence of the sins that we've committed and of the sins that are in the world around us. That things in the human machine, as Lewis likes to call it, get a little out of alignment. And it makes it harder to make better decisions because we're not what we're supposed to be. So let's take a look a little bit at the Bible. If you have your New Testament, I'll be in Romans, and I'll have it on the screen, of course. Just kidding, not Romans. I'm going to get to Romans. Uh, the Old Testament starts this conversation. This is Jeremiah 6.15. Were they ashamed when they committed an abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed. They did not know how to blush. What the prophet comments on is there's something wrong with the consciences of these people. God gave you a conscience so that you would feel embarrassed when you did embarrassing things. But Jeremiah says, they did an embarrassing thing, but they don't feel embarrassed. Why not? Well, they've lost the capacity to blush. Is a really, it's kind of a funny way to say it, but you know exactly what he's talking about, right? If you do something embarrassing long enough, you forget to be embarrassed. You become kind of immune to your own internal uh, sensor that says, hey, that was a bad idea. So it's not just that you're choosing wrong, it's that you've actually lost one of the things that helps you choose right. And that happens to us over time. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Uh, our culture, we're all romantics. 
We, we love a good song that talks about following your heart and we love a good movie that ends with the moral to go follow your heart. Jeremiah says your heart is an idiot. Your heart has no idea what it wants. It's sick. It's diseased. Following your heart could be a terrible idea. Not to say everything about your heart is bad, but something is. Right? He says it's desperately sick. It, it has something wrong with it that, so that it's not necessarily trustworthy anymore on its own. 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. It talks about a person who is, it calls him a liar, an insincere liar. I don't know what a sincere liar would be a whole other critter, I guess, but an insincere liar And this person has lied so much, he doesn't even feel bad for lying anymore. First time you tell a lie, you feel bad, and sometimes you even tell on yourself, and you go to mom and dad, I lied. No, you weren't supposed to. And then the second time you tell a lie, catch me. And then the third time, and then you, you get accustomed to it. Sometimes you can even start to believe your lie, that you've told it so many times. The conscience becomes seared. What's what's seared mean? Yeah, you, I uh, was foolishly uh, working on my my muffler the other day on my little Ford Ranger that my dad has bequeathed me, and uh, I was trying to get uh, to see what part I was going to need to work on the muffler, and I drove to O'Reilly's and then thought you know, I need to look at that one more time before I go in and reached under there and touched it after I had driven it and thought, well, this is going to end poorly. And like all of this and this and this and this was scalded and blistered for about a month. And I just kept my hand in my pocket and preached anyway so you didn't know that I was, you know, mangled beyond disbelief. But uh, now... I've got some new skin there. I still have a spot or two where I can't quite feel the way I'm supposed to, where I can tell it's there's something tingly there, but it's not quite right. The, the scar tissue remained. It was a deep burn. Well, that's what's happening to the conscience. You lie, you lie, you lie, you lie. When I first touched the, the muffler and it was hot, I really felt it. Now I probably wouldn't feel it hardly at all. That, right, I'm gaining an advantage. No, don't do it again. Uh, it's a bad idea. Uh, Titus 1, 15, 16, To the pure all things are pure, to the defiled and unbelieving nothing is pure, but both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. I mean, listen to how he's describing a person trapped in their sin, and that could be all of us. What does he say? Both their mind and their conscience is defiled. Not just their conscience, but even the mind, the, the thing I use to think, might be damaged by my sin over time. And then at the end, unfit for any good work. It's not just that they aren't doing a good thing. This guy couldn't do anything good if he wanted to because he's lost the doing good equipment. He, he no longer has the capacity because of the damage sin has done in his life. So what does that feel like? The guy you want to ask about psychology, oddly enough, in the New Testament is Paul, who has this one little section in Romans where it sounds like he's laid out on somebody's couch talking to his therapist. And it's the most raw and real, authentic section, in my mind, of the whole New Testament, of a person talking about what it feels like to sin. Here's Romans 7, 15 through 20. I do not understand my own actions. I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. I had to practice reading that. It's a hard sentence, and yet when you read it, 
there's, there's a part of you that just gets it. I mean, it, linguistically, grammar-wise, this is just a mess. He's all, I do the thing I do not want, I do the thing I do not want. It sounds like green eggs and ham in places. It's really hard to read. But what he's describing is the feeling that every one of us has with our sin of knowing you're supposed to do one thing, looking it right in the face, and picking the other thing. And this is Paul the Apostle, who by all accounts was a pretty decent fellow, saying, this is what it feels like when I sin. I look right at the thing I'm supposed to do, I know I'm supposed to do it, and I pick the other thing. And the way he describes it, it's almost like, he says, there's, it's almost like there's somebody else inside of me that he describes as the flesh or sin. It's like there's somebody else in there making choices because I look at the thing I'm supposed to do and I don't do it. And that is just as honest a description of human failure as you're ever going to read. He goes on, So I find it to be a law that when I do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so that I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. See, the law is really good at telling me I'm a sinner. It has not helped me much to make better choices. There is something wrong with me. O oh, wretched man that I am. Some of the old uh, Christian hymn writers um, what am I thinking? Is, it, is it an Isaac Watts song? He, he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I. They, they had edited, if you get a new hymnal, it says for such a one as I, because Christians didn't like the idea of calling themselves a worm. But the, but the author said, for such a worm as I, a wretched man that I am. It's that feeling of... I, I feel like I can't make the right decision. And it's frustrating because you do make some good decisions, and every time you make a good decision, it reminds you apparently there's part of you that is capable. But guess what's going to happen tomorrow? I'm going to make the wrong decision again. And I'm going to know it. So in terms of like how that feels psychologically, when you get accustomed to doing the wrong things, we, we call this a, a fallen state, right? God made us here, and we've kind of ended up here. And we can argue about how we got there. Is it inherited or nature or nurture or whatever, or all of it combined in a soup of genetics that no one understands? Whatever it is, we started out here. Right now we're down here. Paul says, I'm not what I'm supposed to be. When you're fallen and you make an evil choice, it feels natural because the equipment is broken. The thing that's supposed to tell you whether it's right or wrong is broken. And so you say, ah, oh, it feels great. It feels good. It feels satisfying. It's what I should be doing. By contrast, good choices feel very unnatural and forced. I didn't like doing that at all. Why not? Again, the thing that's supposed to tell you whether that was a good idea or not inside of us is damaged. I, I disagree with John Calvin, the great Protestant theologian, who would say it's destroyed. You have zero capacity to do anything good ever. I don't think that's true. I don't think we're damaged in that way, but I think we're damaged. I, I think something has been dinged up. The suspension is not quite right. Something is wrong. By contrast now, listen to Paul's optimism. Chapter 7 is his despair, wretched man that I am. Chapter 8 is his optimism that God could fix it. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. See the difference? Chapter 7, wretched man that I am, couldn't do right if I wanted to, and I do want to. Chapter 8, there's no condemnation. How is that possible? For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh 
in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. A lot going on in that sentence, paragraph, but the big point is God accomplished what we weren't ever going to accomplish. God accomplished what we weren't ever going to accomplish. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to the God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. They're not, doesn't say they're not likely to, cannot. Broken, damaged. What's Paul suggesting? What if God were to get inside of us and start repairing the brokenness, or as Lewis says, curing the disease? What if the thing that's supposed to tell you right and wrong could be fixed? Not by you, but by God changing you from the inside out. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him, but if Christ is in you, Although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Okay? And the, the big point at the end there, don't miss it. You're damaged. Okay? You're a human being who's damaged. Christ was dead. Whatever's wrong with you, dead is worse. God fixed dead. The same spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead can fix your conscience and fix your mind. You're not dead like that. You're dead in a different way. If God can cure dead, he can cure you. And he does that by the spirit on the inside making it possible again for the right and wrong chooser thing to know what's going on. All of that's a little mysterious because it's talking about what's going on in my own head, which is notoriously difficult to describe, right? Again, how do you describe free will? If I say to you, if I say to you, um, dinner tonight, do you want chicken or fish? Pizza, obviously, right? How do you make that decision? If you were to sit down and try to explain that to someone, you know, an alien from another planet says, tell me how you pick dinner each night. Well, sometimes we don't. We just yell at each other for an hour. But when you do pick dinner, how do you make that simple decision? It's complicated what's going on in there. Now think about it in a more important thing. How do you do something morally good or bad? Describe that thought process. Paul did it just as well as you can. It's like there's two people in my head, and I need one of them to be fixed really badly. And the Spirit of God can do that. When that happens, now it just reorients everything. Instead of being fallen, if I'm a new creature in Christ, and the Spirit's at work within, now the evil choice that felt so natural before starts to feel unnatural because my conscience is being repaired. The thermostat works again. New creature faces a good choice, and he says, that is a good choice. I recognize it for what it is. Being repaired from the inside out. So all that to say, the bad psychological material is not a sin, but a disease. It does not need to be repented of, but to be cured. So there's two parts of the problem. There's the bad choices we're making, and there's what's wrong with us nudging us towards bad choices. The bad choices need to be forgiven. But what about this other part? Psychologists are really good, Lewis says, at telling us it's there. They can draw you a nice map of it. But what do you do with it? He says Christianity says something about that. Christianity says that God is actually fixing you from the inside. Not just forgiving you, fixing you from the inside out. And that's an entirely different way of looking at it than I think a lot of times we do. Um, one more little biblical excursion, and I'll get back to Lewis. Here's Paul again in Ephesians 4, 
Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. Futility. Like they have minds, the minds aren't working. They are darkened in their understanding. It's not just that they can't see or they aren't looking, it's that they can't get the whole picture. Alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart, they have become callous and given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. See how he, both of those, there's bad choices and something wrong with you, and the something wrong with you is helping you make bad choices. So they feed on each other. It's a little bit of both. But that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about Him and were taught in Him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off the old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. That's Paul, Romans 7, this guy that just does whatever he wants. And to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self. See, I, I need something different inside. I need the parts replaced. But who can do that? Created after the likeness of God and the true righteousness and holiness. You're a participant in it, but it's also an act of creation. God's going to have to ship you new parts. You can't build them in your garage. You can't fix all the things that's wrong with you. Spirituality is going to have to be an inside job. And our, our goal is to participate in that. Okay. okay, a few more points from Lewis, and then I'll pause and let you guys argue with me about human nature and, and psychology, Mark. We'll open it up for you. Um, when you take this view of morality, it changes the way you evaluate people. So Lewis says, when a man who has been perverted from his youth and taught that cruelty is the right thing does some tiny little kindness, he may in God's eyes be doing more than you and I would do if we gave up life itself for a friend. He says, because what you don't know is what if that guy is actually more damaged on the inside than you could possibly know or see? And even that marginally good step took more willpower than this other thing that you do by default. I grew up in a home where my dad was a minister. We went to church on Sundays. In my life, I have never had to make a moral choice about what I was going to do on Sunday. Like, it has never occurred to me, you know what we could do on Sunday? Not go to church. I, it's built in. Like, for me, it requires zero willpower. And then they gave me a job. So now it's even easier, right? It requires zero willpower for me to get up and go to church on Sunday. So I could go to, to judgment, right, and hold up my perfect attendance sheet. And God's going to say, well, yeah, of course you go to church all the time. You started like this and ended like that. Of course, that was easy for you. There is another guy, grew up in a very different home, finds church a very intimidating place to be. Just walking through our doors is an act of courage. Right? Him doing that once and me doing it every week may not even compare what he's doing to get here. So there's a difference in how you evaluate people, and that's just you know, a silly little example of whether you show up at 9.30, or 9.37 for some of you, I know. Uh, that is why Christians are told not to judge. We see only the results which a man's choices make out of his raw material. I can't peer inside your head and see what led you to this choice. All I get are the results. I don't know why you lied to me. I just know you lied. So I can get mad about it and I can judge you for it. I don't know. You know I'm gonna make it a hard one for a second. Some guy beats his kids. That's really hard for me to be sympathetic towards. It just makes me mad. My blood pressure rises thinking about it. God knows what to do about that. And God also knows whether his dad beat him, too. He knows where he learned that. 
It doesn't make bad choices good. Everyone understand? I'm not suggesting that bad background makes everything okay. But God knows what it takes to overcome some of the raw material and what you're fighting against. Whereas I can just look at that. My dad didn't beat me and think, well, what's wrong with me? The thing that didn't bother me may very well bother you. And so it's so difficult then to judge because we don't have the information. Which is why God says, don't do that. <laughs> you don't have what it takes. You don't have the equipment. You don't have the information. Furthermore, he says, all your life long, you are slowly turning this central choosy thing either into a heavenly creature or into a hellish creature. He says the whole process is this transformation inside. And every choice is marching in one direction or another. So that's why for Lewis, the choices are so important. Because the goal isn't just to be good enough to get caught up into heaven or not be bad enough to end up in hell. He says you are being transformed every day into a person who's either determined to be in hell or to be with God. And it's changing you from the inside out. And that change is what we're looking for. Christianity is not about a threshold that we're trying to get everybody to the same spot. We're aiming for a direction. We're looking for change. Any positive step is a good step, no matter how far behind the pack you are. And any negative step is a bad step, no matter how righteous you may out front appear to be. It's about the direction that we're turning. The right direction leads not only to peace, but to knowledge. Good people know about both good and evil. Bad people do not know about either. And that's one of his gutsier statements. Uh, that He says uh, Christians know more about sin than sinners do. Oh, come on. What are you talking about? Christians are naive and moralistic. And, yeah, and so when, when God starts straightening your brain out and your soul from the inside out, you have a better grasp of the whole picture than you did before. Paul can describe it the way he does, right? And say, I know what it's like. I can describe the feeling of making bad choices. It's really hard for a person making those choices to be able to self-diagnose. There's a reason we go see therapists, right? Because it's hard to describe what's going on in your own head. Lewis says, but when we're healthy, when God starts fixing us, it's kind of amazing what comes to light. Okay. That's what I wanted to talk about. So let me ask some questions and then let you fire back. My questions go like this. Feel free to ignore them and ask your own. Does Lewis give a good account of the difference between morality and psychology? Do you think that's fair? Does that make sense? Too simple, too complicated. Could there be such a thing as a Christian psychology? Like, Is, there, is, is that a topic Christians could become experts in and really offer something to the world as Christians? Or is that just a secular pursuit that has nothing to do with Christianity? Uh, does Lewis give a good account of how we make our choices? Tipped my hand there. There's at least one part of it where I'm not satisfied. Choosing involves choosing, I think, is cheating, but you know, whatever. Um, and then does Lewis make you think differently about how you judge others? If so, how? And what do you think about all that? Time for me to stop talking.